for understanding different processes and mechanisms in neuroscience. And I'll do this with my colleague, um, Agnes LaCruz. So, uh, to begin with, I want to reorient again to things that you've been hearing all morning, but in a slightly different perspective. And this is saying, what are the benefits of a developmental perspective on neuroscience? Um, and we like to think about coming at our research questions um, with these different kinds of frameworks. One would be, we can go after understanding of fundamental mechanisms of how typical adaptive functioning with cognitive, physical, social, emotional development emerges. Um, and then we can also say what happens when those processes go awry. And so we talk about this a lot in terms of typical and atypical research having this reciprocal function. And although people may be sort of grounded in one starting point versus the other, the crosstalk um, between these perspectives is really what's driving each of these different sub-frameworks forward. Um, with development, we can also look at trajectory. So we can identify um, both precursors, what's going on before some particular mechanism um, emerges or goes awry. And then by doing that, we can also identify really key points of potential intervention and or prevention. Um, and, and the last here is, is highlighting a framework having to do with this notion of uh, environmental influence plasticity, and sensitive periods. And so those can all be layered on these two first broader overarching frameworks that we have. Um, let's see here. So a uh, number of these names you've seen already, but this is going to be situated in a slightly different order for you. This is talking about if we break development down into different phases or stages, if you will, um, and taking a look at some of the key players, again, not an exhaustive list, but some of the key players here at UMass, and the type of models that they use. Because one thing we know for development, we are gaining a lot of interesting knowledge and forward momentum in our research studies based upon what type of model uh, you start with. So all the names in red are folks who um, focus on human models, and all the names in blue are non-human models, all the different examples that you've seen illustrated previously. Um, and so one thing I want to highlight is that uh, although we have a strength in early nervous system um, development at the embryonic stage, I'm not going to attempt to try and cover that right here. You're going to hear a little bit more about that in a few minutes, and you've already heard some of it as well. Um, so I'm going to focus on the latter five postnatal stages. Um, and I want to first highlight a couple of broad research topics that span multiple phases here, and then I'm going to give you some specific examples of research questions that are covered um, within those different phases and with those different types of um, developmental frameworks, if you will. So attention is one, and we think about all those different examples that Rosie had just highlighted for us. We've got strengths in looking at different facets of both very basic orienting attention mechanisms all the way up to more complex executive attention processes spanning childhood, young adult, um, and then the middle older adulthood range. We also have strengths in looking at auditory processing along these same phases. Um, and one thing I just want to highlight here, because I, I do study kids, so that part of um, understanding what's going on with hearing loss in older adults in noisy environments, we're also really interested in what's going on with kids and learning in noisy environments in the classroom, because they're trying to have their cognition come online. And so it's an interesting way to have crosstalk um, about the similar auditory emerging um, function, but looking at it from different points of the lifespan. We also have a lot of strength um, in decision-making processes, different facets of that, things related to uh, executive function. And this permeates all of these levels, although I'll highlight that we have many different people looking at these questions from different angles, but broadly they can be connected at the level of understanding decision-making. Um, and another very uh, strong area for us is understanding emotion reactivity and emotion regulation. So for this next part, I'm going to focus on the first four phases, and I'm going to let um, Anya cover the last one here at the end. And we're going to be talking about a couple of examples of atypical cognitive and affective function. Um, and I want to highlight we do have a fair amount of work on typical development, uh, which has already been highlighted uh, throughout the previous presentations. But it's, again, just emphasizing how much you're seeing this developmental perspective is sort of coming out um, through all of our sub-areas and different facets. So the first thing I want to, that was fast. Okay, <laughs> the first question I want to tackle is what is the role of early experience in shaping cognitive and affective function? Taking this really broad question, um, and as you can see, 
The right half of the slide is human work and the left half of the slide is animal work. Um, and we know from previous work that um, deprived caregiving environments is really uh, not optimal for the developing brain. And the way that we look at this uh, in children is we can get these EEG, ERP measures of how they are processing different tasks. And so that's all the lines you see over there, um, that they are not functioning up to par with their peers when they've had poor early caregiving environments. Um, and so most of my work has been identifying different facets of cognition and emotion where this is going awry. Um, and a more exciting area for me is collaborating with clinical researchers um, who actually have interventions aimed at changing the child's environment. And what's really fascinating for us is sometimes we're not actually directly working with the child, but we are influencing their caregiving environment and their interventions focusing on work um, with those caregivers. Some of these are foster parents and sometimes biological parents. And that's having this sort of trickle-down effect on the child's neural development. And so we can see improvement um, so that they're functioning at the same level as peers. And in some skill sets, they're actually functioning even better than their peers post-intervention. Um, and then on the other side of the, the question, sort of trying to get more at translational models, we are using other tools and techniques, and so this is um, work from Jerry Myers and uh, Melinda Novak and their team and collaborators, where they're really focused on measures of stress um, and linking those measures to these outcome cognitive performance um, facets. And so here we can see different things, like if we look at hair court, which is a measure of prenatal um, environmental stress for these uh, infant macaques here, that they are doing rather poorly on inhibitory control tasks. But also another really interesting um, direction they've taken this is that they're looking at the amount of court in mother's milk and the impact that that has on um, the, the monkeys functioning both in terms of cognition, so inhibitory control tasks, as well as their social initiation, so that sort of social emotional functioning piece of it. And in that realm there, they've got a lot of evidence supporting this lactational programming hypothesis. And this is found to be um, particularly influential for the male offspring. So going back to questions of sex differences, um, combining with our questions of environmental influence here. We can also ask, what are key sensitive periods in modulating risk for this atypical cognitive functioning and um, affective regulation? And one example of doing this is focusing on a particular population. And so this is work from my lab um, with Lisa Harvey, who's a, a clinician here. And we were asking um, preschool children who have um, not been diagnosed with ADHD yet, but have high, high symptom rates and are likely to be diagnosed later on. The um, average age of diagnosis doesn't start until elementary school, so we're trying to get at this, this early picture of it. Um, and we tasked them with trying to complete a cognitive uh, measure while we were frustrating them. So we said, keep playing this game. The computer's not going to work very well throughout. And as you're playing this game, try and suppress your emotions as you go through. Um, and as you can see, this is something where we have a lot of change in the typically developing kids. The colors are representing the different phases of the games and what they're being asked to do. Um, and we have almost no neural modulation um, in our ADHD kids with this. But then we give them a different task. And we say, we'd like you to just now look at these different emotion faces on the screen. Just look at them as you go through here. Press a button every once in a while when this orange marker comes on the screen so we know that you're looking. Um, and we have complete opposite pattern. And so essentially what we're seeing is before the typical diagnosis age uh, for kids with ADHD, we have this early emerging, what I'll call right now loosely, mismodulation of neural resources. So when typically developing kids can keep things together and keep it under control, that's a, a difficult situation for the ADHD kids and vice versa. And moving forward uh, with this research, we're collaborating with Becky Spencer and we're saying, what can we learn about um, the developing brains in these different populations when we're looking at it from respect to um, what else they're doing during that whole 24 hour day and that significant period of hopefully sort of resetting that sleep does for us. And we are finding emerging difference um, in the sleep of these same children who were in our, um, in our labs doing these studies with ADHD. 
Um, we can also ask about sensitive periods uh, for things like depression. And here we have a real strength that has already been highlighted um, briefly in earlier presentations of work of Jeff Blaustein and Sally Powers. Um, and, and I really wanted to take a moment to highlight this because this is not only um, the example of the start of the stress research group, but the, the strength behind the stress research group was in this translational crosstalk that was going on between Jeff, who has this um, rodent model here, and Sally, who's looking at um, human teenagers, and what's going on with different influences that are shaping trajectories for their risk for depression. Um, and part of this group has been bringing in folks from other areas. And so here I also want to highlight that we've brought in epidemiologists. Um, and there's been a lot of talk with Liz Bertone Johnson, who has worked on the Nurses Health Study, which is going to give you a very broad um, span looking at risk for depression and a range of different markers. And so we've got some um, co-publications that have come out of this and really sort of strengthening of each individual's research questions by adding in these new layers of perspective. Um, another uh, interesting example of looking at depression actually can happen in the transition to parenthood phase. And so building off um, a vol model, which was originally um, run here, we see that for voles, what's really important is when they go through um, labor to have their, their infants, it's a dramatic shift. And that uh, signal of labor is actually what's causing their initiation of parenting behaviors. And so if you interfere with their experience of those physiological signals, you don't get that same caregiving behavior. You have aggression continuing. Um, so Maureen Perry Jenkins in our clinical area here has a large sample of first time moms, low SES population. And she realized through crosstalk that she said, I can look at this question. Um, in my moms too. And I can say, what's the difference between moms who go through um, a, a traditional typical birth versus moms who need to have a C-section and have a different experience of those physiological signals? Um, and she actually did find that if you go through um, having a C-section instead of the traditional birthing process, you have sort of a slightly increased risk for postpartum depressions. But for the moms who went through the traditional process, their risk goes way down over time. And so it's another nice um, example of this crosstalk and taking our own individual data to sort of new levels and new perspectives. And then um, to sort of wrap it up here, we want to get at how can this translational modeling support understanding of development from parenting through childhood. And so here I get to highlight um, new colleagues. Mariana Pereira, who's been here under two years, and Kirby Dieter Decker, who's been here under two months, actually like a month to the day today, I think. Um, and so Mariana's work in a rodent model is saying what's going on based on this sort of dynamic interaction that happens um, when you have a rodent becoming a parent and what's going on with their cognitive um, affective and sort of motivational processes through this interaction with their infant. How does that impact the mom? And then Kirby comes in on the other side and he says, all of this stuff that's going on with the parent, what's the intergenerational transmission um, of that starting point of the mom and what's getting passed on to the kid? Um, his focus is on um, behavioral neurogenetics and he also really strongly looks at attention and he's done modeling of attention um, based upon this child's early experience interaction with their mom all the way up through grade school. And so um, I know we're very excited to have more crosstalk going on um, in this direction as well. So instead of taking just one mechanism at one or two time points, we can really take it to this big, broad, um, far more comprehensive look at development and what we can answer with our strengths and methods here. And now I'm going to turn it over, um, as I said to Anya, I'm going to let her take care of this whole other part of the developmental span, which is middle through older adulthood. So good morning, everyone. So um, my uh, talk will focus on the later uh, stages of the lifespan. And I would like to start by asking, why is it important to study uh, the neuroscience of aging? And of course, uh, as you know, our world is aging. Um, so the uh, people live longer. Uh, this is actually here. The, uh, the maximum lifespan of a human uh, is 122 <coughs> years old. But uh, the aging population is also uh, growing at an unprecedented rate. Uh, as you can see here, these are the figures for the US. 
we can expect by 2050, 80 million of older people, which correspond to 21% of the population. And uh, it was only 12% uh, of the population in uh, 2000. So of course, uh, this is a concern because advancing age is uh, the greatest risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and it also uh, contributes to the number of strokes. So these disease will be considered in the next talk, so I, I will not mention them, but, but uh, concentrate instead on healthy aging. <laughs> but uh, healthy aging is also a concern uh, because there are large deficits uh, that occur in a cognitive function. Uh, as you can see here, uh, cognitive performance declines with age in all uh, domains considered uh, except verbal knowledge, vocabulary, which actually uh, increases with age. But otherwise there is this large decline um, that is also occurring uh, for motor function. Um, so this is the example of grip strength here that declines uh, linearly with age. And of course, uh, has uh, adverse effects on older people's autonomy. But paradoxically, uh, there are also gains with age. Um, so emotional regulation and emotional well-being increase with age. And we do not understand very well uh, the neural basis of these age-related changes. And at UMass, we have a number of labs uh, that use a variety of techniques to investigate so the neural basis of age-related changes in language, memory, <coughs> and emotion. And, uh, Incurred in our uh, historical strengths in neuroendocrinology, we have also a number of researchers who study uh, specifically sex differences in these processes. And uh, I will talk about this a little bit later. But first, so for the first point, and um, starting with uh, language. So at UMass, we have a, a large network of people working on language processing. And uh, a few neuroscientists asked whether uh, aging affects the neural mechanisms of speech processing, um, in particular uh, speech perception. So you've heard already about the labs of uh, Lisa Sanders, for example, um, who uses ERPs to examine whether aging affects uh, selective attention to auditory signals uh, during speech processing. Uh, Alexandra Jesse uses eye tracking uh, to determine how aging affects uh, multisensory integration during speech processing. And this work is important because uh, in the real world, older people have, are confronted uh, with a lot of complex social and sensory stimuli that are uh, really challenging for the aging brain. On the side of speech perception, uh, we have the lab of Jackie Kurland, uh, for example, who uses fMRI to study the neural mechanisms of word retrieval. And uh, one of our interesting uh, findings is that even minimal practice retrieving names of items is able to uh, alter brain activity patterns and enhance performance in task of uh, word retrieval. Okay, so turning now to uh, memory, of course memory is one of the uh, major complaints of uh, older people and uh, the lab of Rosie Cowell, who you who've just uh, heard about, uh, studies how memory changes with age, and she also uh, wants to determine, uh, using fMRI and neural network mo uh, models, uh, whether these age-related changes are similar to uh, memory deficits that are experienced by people with medial temporal damage. So as I told you earlier, emotion is one of the domains that seem to improve with age. And uh, this is a, an issue that uh, Becky Reddy uh, is studying. So using uh, behavioral measures, uh, physiological measures, and uh, neuroimaging. <coughs> and uh, one of our interesting findings is that uh, older people uh, rely more on executive function and episodic memory for emotional uh, regulation than uh, younger uh, adults. So the lab of uh, Becky Spencer uh, integrates this, this work on memory and emotion uh, to determine whether age-related changes in sleep are actually the driver of these changes, um, especially for memory impairment, but also uh, whether they, uh, uh, they generate 
uh, emotion uh, dysregulation in certain or older people. So in my lab, uh, we are actually addressing some of the same questions uh, using an on-human primate of uh, human aging, the marmoset uh, that uh, Luke talked uh, about earlier. So the marmoset is really a, an interesting model because uh, first of all, they're one of the smallest primates. So they weigh between 300 and 500 grams. They're the size of a rat. So uh, they obviously have uh, many practical advantages. Um, but despite their, uh, their small size, they have a large brain and they're able to uh, complete um, sophisticated cognitive tasks. And for aging, they're particularly interesting because their lifespan is only 10 to 12 years. So in theory, we can study the animal for its entire lifespan. And so um, in my lab, we have a longitudinal study going on uh, to um, examine the normal basis of age-related changes in cognition, emotion, and motor function in the marmoset. So using um, different uh, behavioral measures, we also use uh, telemetry to uh, collect uh, EEG data and assess sleep states, <coughs> uh, as well as uh, temperature measures. We're using uh, neuroimaging, um, studying specifically functional uh, connectivity and how it, it changes with age. And this is in collaboration with uh, Jinking at uh, UMass uh, Medical. And we also have a number of neurobiological measures, uh, including brain estrogen content uh, in collaboration with Luke Ramashili. And we're studying these, uh, these changes in males and females uh, because there is evidence that the trajectories of cognitive decline may differ between uh, the, sex, the sexes. And um, of course, one um, reproductive transition that uh, exists in women and doesn't find its equivalent in men is menopause. Uh, so menopause is associated with uh, adverse effects in a number of systems. And uh, with Lynette Sievert, uh, we are focusing on the major complaints uh, that uh, postmenopausal women or menopausal women um, complain about, and um, trying to develop a marmoset model for these menopausal symptoms. So I would like to point out that there are a lot of people at UMass who, who work on other systems and how they are affected uh, by menopause. And uh, we have close uh, interactions with this group to try to understand menopause in its uh, global context. As an example of a more translational approach um, with Lynette Sievert, we're, we're using the same technique, thermal imaging, uh, to detect hot flashes in female marmosets and women uh, in an effort to understand the, the interactions between hot flashes, sleep disturbances, and cognitive deficits at menopause. And of course, uh, the monkey model provides us with a, with a means to look at uh, mechanisms underlying these, uh, these relationships. So now to um, summarize what uh, Jen uh, and I told you about uh, the, this topic, um, we have identified several strengths at UMass. So for the developmental approach, there is a, a clear crosstalk uh, between areas. Uh, there is a, an emphasis on the fundamental mechanisms and underlying uh, typical development. And there is an effort to uh, take into account the role of experience <laughs> and environment. Uh, for the aging approach, uh, so we, we have a, a lot of people studying the, the normal basis of normal age-related changes in language, memory, and emotion. <coughs> um, we also have uh, expertise in studying sex differences and, and menopausal issues. And uh, I think that UMass has a real strength in having uh, marmosets uh, on campus. Um, so marmosets have been qualified as a biomedical supermodel um, <laughs> because of the many advantages that they, they provide. And one of which uh, being that they are the, the genetic tools, one of the genetic tools of the future as the transgenic marmosets are already uh, being made and uh, so very soon uh, available. So, um, and marmosets are increasingly used in all areas of neuroscience, and I think that 
view mass as a real opportunity to develop this model for um, not only for aging but for all neuroscience areas. So finally, um, there are uh, areas that are uh, opportunities for growth. Uh, for the development, uh, there is a, the need for a more unified uh, research question that, that could be uh, studied from different uh, angles and uh, different levels of analysis. And for the aging area, um, it is clear that we have expertise in, in human and non-humans, non-human primates, uh, but uh, there is a, a big gap with uh, basic neuroscience. And so there is a critical need for more uh, molecular and cellular approaches and for um, studies that are going on in, in more traditional animal models, uh, as invertebrate as well as uh, rodents, of course. So with this, uh, thank you for your attention, and Jen and I will be happy to take your questions. Yeah, I think there, there are a number of people who will, uh, like uh, Rosie Cowell, for example, who will uh, use this, uh, this system for our aging studies, so uh, that, that's what one. Well, so <laughs> the marmoset is another story. The, the marmoset is very small and uh, would need, uh, you know, uh, no imaging that a, is... A different magnet. Yeah, a different magnet that is for small animals. Uh, I think that is... Yeah, I, I think, uh, so, yes, uh, 70 or 90. And... Um, I think this is probably uh, in development, but for the for the immediate uh, future, um, yeah, we'll we'll have to wait. Um, but we can go to uh, UMass Medical for now to to do these studies uh, with jinking. Well, only one for now, so uh, <laughs> my lab. Uh, but uh, Jerry Meyer before me was working uh, with, uh, with marmosets and had some very interesting uh, data on them. So, But yeah, we need more people working on the marmosets. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you a, a question. Do you have uh, adequate animal facilities for the marmosets? So you'll visit them tomorrow. Um, these are, these are adequate, and we know how to take care of, uh, of marmosets. More space is always, you know, always desirable. But uh, yes, I think uh, um, we, yeah, we need to develop that, that space. Yeah.